So, are we be should I start talking even though I can't are you are, are this being recorded? Yes. Okay. All right. So, I can't see exactly what I'll have to keep looking over there. Um and the tech person is on the phone so won't be able to switch cameras right now. Um so what I'm going to talk about Um, today in section, briefly talk about the project, do a, a quick recap, because I started uh, grading them. Um, and then talk about like Cascode, Folded Cascode, and Folded Cascode. Can you go on to the, the sheet? All right, great. OK, I can see, I can see the Mr. Tech Guy. I can see that TV there. Is that what's being broadcast? Okay, so I'll just look at that. All right, sorry about that. Um, so anyhow, so what I'm going to talk about today is a uh, recap of the project, talk a little bit about Cascode and Folded Cascode gain stages. Um, I know Professor Broderson briefly spoke about it, uh, and it's a way to increase the gain of your amplifier um, that should uh, sort of make sense from a lot of uh, a lot of the analysis we've done already, um, and then talk about output stages and look at efficiency and swing um, of the source follower of an ideal class B circuit, as well as uh, get moving towards what what a push pull class B would actually look like. So, um, before I get into this, I want to talk about the project real briefly. I started grading. Uh, the project last night, I ran the scripts to evaluate all your circuits, and I'm pleased to say that everyone who has submitted a circuit so far um, has passed all the specifications. So if you submitted the circuit and uh, you didn't do anything sort of illegal or anything like that, like putting in ideal voltage amplifiers in your circuit, then um, you're off to a very good start. Uh, just picked up the reports and we'll start evaluating those later, but Real good. Um, I don't have a distribution of the FOM stuff. Uh, some people got a little bit ahead of the material of what we've covered and um, used output stages uh, that consume less current than just a standard common source output stage. Uh, and kudos to you for reading ahead in the book. Um, they will be award. Oh, great. They will be awarded. Um, don't worry, you're not going to be penalized for not jumping ahead. Anyhow, okay, so that's that. Um, were there any questions or any 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 quick comments that anyone wanted to make about the project? Um, okay. Okay. Any questions about um, the material that Professor Broderson has been covering over the last week or so? Nothing? Everyone is understanding everything that's going on? Great, that, that makes my job easier. Maybe I should just leave. Um, so let's get into some of the material then. All right, so what I'm going to talk about is the Cascode amplifier, which is a two-transistor amplifier. And I know that, that Professor Broderson has shown this in its differential form. Has, has, have you ever actually gone over and looked at the analysis of a two-transistor Cascode amplifier in class? Has that been something that's been done? Yes, no? OK, no one really remembers. OK. So the Cascode amplifier is pretty straightforward. OK, two transistor amplifier. It looks very similar to the common source, except there's this extra transistor thrown in right here. And this extra transistor um, ends up delivering a lot of gain, uh, additional gain. And so let's call this M1, M2. 
Okay? So, um, there are lots of ways to analyze this circuit, uh, and I'm just going to show you uh, a real simple way. What we can sort of see here is that this is a cascade. You can almost look at this as a cascade of two amplifiers. Okay? So let's draw a line here. Maybe I'll use, ooh, lots of different colors. Let's draw a red line there, although that looks sort of black. Um, so if you look up and call the resistance looking up R effective, let's call this node Vx, what you can draw is this. R effective, um, Vx, Vi. It looks like a common source stage. Okay? That's part one. And what you can also do is then you've got the second stage. That looks like this. Bias. Vx, V out. What does this look like? Am I drawing this too small? Or is that okay? The second stage. So this is M2. So this is M1, M2. Bias, M2, V out. Oops, Vx. What kind of what kind of amplifier is this? Common gate, exactly. So you can sort of look at this this circuit and say, oh, a cascode amplifier is just a cascade of two amplifiers. Okay, you've got the common gate stage here, and you've got excuse me, the common source stage here and the common gate stage here, and we can then calculate all of uh, the gain of each stage. So for the first stage, from Vx to V, now let's calculate Vx to Vx over Vi, okay? Obviously it's Gm times R effective, Gm1 times R effective parallel R out 1, okay? Now, in order to figure out what's going on, we have to calculate what R effective is. And so R effective is the resistance looking into the source of M2. Okay? Can anyone figure out, does anyone recall the expression for what the input impedance of this device is, of M2? Not, it's, that's, that's an approximation that is true most of the time. It's actually equal to RO plus R D or RL or whatever over GM RO. So in this case, what is RD? Infinite. Exactly. So R effective equals infinite. So the gain of this first stage is GM RO, GM1 RO1. Okay? And now let's look at the gain of the second stage. So what is uh, what is the gain of this stage? It's well again. It's actually GM times RD or RL parallel RO. So you end up getting GM two RO two. So the aggregate gain. is equal to GM1 RO1 times GM2 RO2 or GM RO squared. You get an extra extra amount of gain due to this cascode transistor. Now that's also relying upon the fact that this output impedance is very very high, okay? If this were if this output impedance were low, then you wouldn't get that super high gain because in each stage you'd have R, you'd have this RD 
parallel with an RO, and if that RD is low, then the then the then the gain is low for each each little stage. But you can make this impedance high of this current source by cascading the current source in the exact same fashion. Okay. So that's one way of analyzing the circuit. Another way of analyzing the circuit, which is also pretty easy, is analyzing it as a one-stage circuit. Bias Vn M2 M1 um, V out. And that is calculating basically AV, the voltage gain, is equal to big GM times big R out. Okay? So in order to calculate GM, big GM, we attach this V out node to a small signal ground and twiddle uh, V in. And can anyone sort of figure out what the GM, the big GM of this two transistor device is? It's GM1. Because basically, you twiddle this device here, that twiddles a transconductance of M1, and this common gate stage is just, it can be, a, a term that's used a lot is a current conveyor. It takes a current at the input and just routes it right to the output. Okay? So any current, if you have, you know, delta I flowing through here, what that means is you're also going to have delta I flowing through here. So the common gate stage has a current gain of 1. So the net transconductance is just GM1. And then what's R out? Looking down and up. It's equal to infinity. I'll give you the, the first half. I'm doing the easy part, which is looking up. What's the resistance looking down? GM2, RO2. Excuse me? RO1, yeah. You know, you, you, we go back to what we've, what we've learned before, which is that it's now you can look at this as a, as a source degenerated M2. So basically it looks sort of like this. This is M2. This is R01 because that's the output source resistance. And we're looking at the R out here. And so it's just R out times GMRO of this device. Roughly. There's some extra terms thrown in there, but I'm ignoring that. So then, you, yes? No. It would absolutely not be the same, um, and that's something that would be a good exercise. So you're saying if V in is, if v in is here and this is a bias? Yes, but what's, okay, so, so the R out would be the same. But now, what would the would the GM be the same? Just for the output resistance. Yeah, yeah. When you when you look at the output resistance, so it's um, all the biases as well as the input voltages are considered small signal grounds. So whether you switch the bias, switch the bias and the input resistance, that doesn't matter. Switch in the input source, that doesn't matter because in small signal, they're both small signal grounds. Yeah. So yes, you're in, in in that sense, yes, that's true. So that's how you calculate R out, and you put them together. GM R out is equal to GM1 times GM2 times RO2 times RO1, which is exactly what we calculated in the other way. So that is the standard telescopic cascode. Now what we can see here is that because we have the second device here, we're getting extra gain for free, right? So it's like fantastic, extra, more gain, like no extra current, a little bit of extra area, but realistically, that's no big deal. You know, there's got to be a downside, right? You can't, you can't just get better performance for basically free. So what, what performance uh, specification are you losing by adding this cascode device? Swing, exactly. Because now, VO min, so bef VO min assuming all this is biased optimally, is equal to VDSAT1 plus VDSAT2. Whereas for a common source stage, you don't have that same sort of problem. Okay. So, 
as uh, Professor Broderson showed in lecture uh, uh, just the other day, the cascoded stuff can be used in differential amplifiers as well, just like common, you know, yeah. So you can also have things like this. You can have you can have stages like this that have I'm just gonna draw them ah, what do I want to draw? So oh okay. So you can you can basically cascode you can use cascodes in differential stages. And again, the issue is reduced swing. So you know this might have a cascode load where well so this might have a cascoded load as well. I don't feel like drawing all that stuff because it's not crucially important right now. So that's that's the cascode amplifier. Um, it is very useful. Um, one of the issues of this of this kind of device is that um, now what 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 is done is I think as Professor Broderson showed you is effectively. Insert, you effectively use a transit. You use a transistor to effectively insert a battery between this gate and the source, so that this device always stays in saturation. And the reason for doing that is that as, let's say, the common mode of this device of these of the input goes up, that means that this node is going to go up as well. So that means to keep these primary devices in saturation, this bias needs to go up. Okay. So effectively, what what Professor Broderson showed was putting a diode connected transistor with some current running through it to function as your battery. Okay. The issue here now is that your swing at the output is now coupled into um, the common mode of the input. Okay. So if your common mode goes up and down a fair bit. That means your output swing is, is is limited because your output swing, as your common mode goes up, your output swing gets smaller. Okay? So that's just something to keep in mind. And that was basically the reason why um, the for the project you couldn't just have a single stage device, even if you could get the required gain out of it, a single stage amplifier because we've got a couple things going on. This common mode goes up and down, and this node needs to swing as well at the output. So um, if, this, if this is your output node and these are your input nodes, if you could design to meet your gain at one, at, at, with one stage, um, you wouldn't also simultaneously be able to meet the swing specification. Okay. So, so what I'm getting at is that these Stages with cascodes and stuff, or stages with more complicated circuits like differential circuits, where you're going to have common mode variation, are typically at some at the input stages. And the reason why is because if you yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, we did. You're right. We didn't. We didn't. We didn't insert those corner specs, like like VIC in one direction and V out swung in one direction. Um, so it's conceivable that you could do it, but realistically, um, well, in 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 more real design problems, uh, you wouldn't. You would have trouble doing it. And I even think that just the common mode swing alone might make it difficult. I don't know. I don't know. If you if you did a circuit that met those spec in that fashion, then yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it certainly is possible, but in, in reality, um, the problem he, with this sort of circuit is that you're you're limiting your swing, which is why the output stages tend to be relatively simple in order to keep your swing up. Okay. And so later on, I'm not going to talk about it now. Uh, Professor Broderson will talk about folded cascodes, 
which are similar to CAS codes, but you're sort of folding the circuit over on itself, um, and that allows you to have higher swing. Okay, so, but I'm not going to get into that now. So what I am going to talk about now, so any questions on, on the CAS code amplifier? Okay. Is uh, our output stages. So this is page four. All right. So, um, one of the important metrics of output stages, or some of the important metrics of output stages, are swing. And obviously, we all know what that means, right? See, it's the it's the voltage swing at that the output can attain while still keeping a relatively high gain, right? Um, just being able to swing out exactly to the rail is useless if the gain out there is very low, or if the gain all of a sudden changes. Okay. And the other thing, which is very important, is efficiency. Professor Broderson uh, started mentioning this on Wednesday, I believe. And efficiency, which is typically eta, I think that's the Greek letter eta, um, is defined as the power delivered to the load over the total power consumed. So as in the case of um, the circuit the, uh, the design project one, there was a load resistance, right? And you had to achieve a swing on a load resistance. So therefore, putting, putting a signal across, a, a swing across a load resistance implies um, that, that the load resistance is burning some power. And, you know, so therefore, no matter what, in order to get that signal onto the load, you're going to be consuming, th you're going to be dissipating the power that is dissipated by the load. That is the bare minimum of the power that you can consume. Ideally, however, you don't want your circuit to be consuming any additional iota of power beyond that. So therefore, efficiency of 100% means that the total power consumed is equal to the power dissipated in the load. Right? So therefore, that's, that's as good as you can get. You're never going to get 100% efficiency circuits, um, but, but we can analyze what kind of efficiency you can actually achieve. Yes? Um, so when you talk about the total power consumed, is it just the last phase? No, it's, it's, typically, it's typically the entire amplifier. Uh, but as you probably learned from this last amplifier design, the bulk of the power is consumed by the output stage. So when you're analyzing the efficiency of a given stage, then you're just talking about the efficiency of that stage. But in reality, uh, when you're really talking about efficiency overall, you're talking about all the extra current ba power that's dissipated. So if you've, got, if you've got an awful bias network that consumes a ridiculous amount of power, the circuit, like, like the battery doesn't care that the power is being dissipated by the, uh, by the bias instead of by the primary output stage. It's just that extra waste, extra power is being wasted. Okay? Yes? Well, we're going to start analyzing that. Um, and uh, it depends on what application you're talking about. Um, things like RF power amplifiers have relatively low efficiency, and I will admit that that's kind of getting outside of my realm of expertise. I don't know much about power amplification, but uh, depending on the architecture, and I'll show this in just a second, depending on the architecture you choose, um, there will be limits to the, um, there will be upper bounds to the efficiency that you can achieve. Okay, so I'm going to show you two, two architectures that can achieve radically different um, maximal power efficiencies, okay? So, so one thing to keep in mind is that let's say you've got some complicated circuit here, and I'm just going to, don't copy this down, but, you know, I'm just trying to make a point here. So, I just drew a bunch of transistors in a configuration. I don't really even know what this does, but that's not, that's not particularly important. So we want to calculate what the total power consumed of this circuit is. 
Okay. What we can do is we can look at, you know, let's take M1, and we can look at the voltage across M1 and the current through M1, so V1, I1. So the instantaneous power of M1 is just whatever V1 times I1 is. Okay? And, oh, something else that I forgot to mention is that efficiency is always measured with a balanced sinusoid as the stimulus. So you're always putting in a sine wave and getting out a sine wave. Okay. So, you know, there'll be something like this here, and then this is driving some load, and so something like that there. Okay. Sinusoidal drive. Okay. So the instantaneous power uh, uh, dissipated by M1 is P1 is, v, is the voltage across the drain source of 1 times the current through it. Okay, and the average power, PM1, I'll, I, I indicate average by putting a bar over it, is basically the integral over one period, so T is the period of the sinusoidal drive, 0 to T, V1 times I1. Okay, and then you can do, so the average power dissipated is just the summation of P and N average from N equals 1 to however many devices there are. The point is, this is very tedious mathematics. This will take you a long time if you calculate the average power dissipated by each device and then sum it. There's a far easier way to do it. Does anyone have a guess as to what the far easier way to calculate what the total power consumed is? Sure. Okay, well this could be fine. So this could be, you know, whatever this is, if it's a, if it's a device. And we, we don't even need to assume that the current through these devices up here is constant. Okay, so regardless, even still there's a simple way to do it. And I think you are starting to get, starting to say it. Exactly. So all the current, uh, the thing to keep in mind is that all the power dissipated in this circuit has to come from somewhere. It has to come from a power source. So the power dissipated, conservation of energy, dictates that the total power dissipated, or total energy dissipated, or average power dissipated, um, will be equal to the power supplied. So over here, what I didn't draw is that you've got your power supply here, VDD. So all you need to do is measure an, an IVDD, IDD, whatever. So the the power, the instantaneous total power, is equal to IDD times VDD, and then the average power is just you take the integral of that. So that, so now you only have one integral to do. And typically, you know, there's going to be some constant component to this and some sinusoidal component to this. And so it, it ends up being pretty straightforward to calculate. And the nice thing is that IDD is a function of T, but VDD is not. VDD is constant. So it really is equal VDD over T, the integral from 0 to T, IDD of T, oops, DT. And so IDD of T is going to be equal to some IDD constant plus some IDD hat times sinusoid of uh, whatever input stimulus you're, you're driving. And the nice thing is that when you integrate this, this thing falls out. So calculating what the constant current is is very straightforward, typically, and so getting the the power uh, delivered the the power delivered by the power source is re is typically a straightforward calculation. Does that make sense to everyone? I realize I've made a couple of mathematical and, and logical leaps here. Any questions? Yes. For the project that you handed in, it. Cal it just calculated the instantaneous quiescent power about the zero operating point. 
So it wasn't doing the average power. Okay? Yes? So then you say we don't need to take into account the changing terms. It's a constant term, and the sign of solid current, it basically cancels out the current. It's positive and negative. Exactly. In general. In general. Yeah. Okay? So now let's actually calculate the efficiency for our favorite circuit, the source follower. It's not our favorite circuit, but it's our favorite circuit of the day, because that's what we're doing. Whoops. Okay, so this is our circuit, and the input stimulus, VI of T, is equal to some bias voltage plus V hat times sine of 2 pi T. So T goes between 0 and 1 in this case, to do one complete sinusoid. Okay? And VB is chosen such that V out, this is V out of T, of T, is equal to 0 plus V hat times sine of 2 pi T. In other words, the bias voltage at this node is chosen such that the bias voltage here is exactly 0 volts. So, there is no bias current flowing through RL. Okay? Okay. And what I'm also assuming here is that the gain of the source follower... <laughs> Did I miss something? No. Oh. <laughs> uh, the I, I'm assuming that the gain of the source follower... of the source follower equals 1. Okay? So I'm assuming it's an ideal buffer. In other words, what I'm doing is tying the uh, tying the bulk to the to the source so that the back body transconductance device doesn't isn't active okay so now let's calculate uh, what so, so in order to calculate efficiency is equal to P load over P supply so first things first let's calculate P load Okay? So given that the output is basically V hat, where V hat is just the amplitude of your stimulus, of your input sinusoid, what is the power dissipated by the load? What's the power of a sinusoidal voltage over a resistor? The average power. V squared over 2R. Okay, you may have forgotten that. It's time to remember it. Okay, the instantaneous power, this is P, P load instantaneous, is equal to V hat times IR, which is equal to V hat times V hat over R. Okay, and then when you, w so, so the instantaneous power is V squared over R. When you integrate that over a sine wave, the average power is V hat over, V, oops, no one caught my mistake. Okay, so, um, what do I want to do here? Okay, so that's the power of the load. What is, what is the power drawn by the supply? The average power. Exactly. It's V supply times the average of I supply. And basically, because this thing is always pulling down IB no matter what, so this is going to be, let's call this IR. The current pulled down from here is going to be 
IB plus IR. IR is a perfectly balanced sinusoid. So the average current pulled down from here is going to end up being the average current pulled down from here as well, pulled into here as well. So it's equal to 2 VDD times IB. Okay? So eta is equal to V hat squared over 2R over, am I doing this right? Yeah, over 2 VDD times IB. Okay, that doesn't give us any sense as to, and I'll move this up a little bit, that doesn't give us any sense as to what eta max is. But now we start applying some of our circuit intuition. Yes? Why is it, why is it 2 VDD? Because the, the V supply this, this supply is plus VDD, this supply is minus VDD. Oop, sorry. So, that, so I'm, I'm drawing it balanced around zero. I and mean, I could do VDD over 2 up here and VDD over minus VDD over 2 down there, but just through the convention. Good question. All right. So, so this is our expression for eta. What can we say about the relationship between VDD and V hat? with this circuit. Okay? And under the assumption that basically VT goes to zero and VGS, VD sat, goes to zero, clearly V hat has to be less than VDD. This output node is not going to go outside these ranges. Okay? So if we could come up with a really nice transistor that has a really low VT and a really low VD sat, then V hat could basically approach, so V hat is going to be less than or equal to VDD. Does everyone see that? Does everyone understand why I'm saying that? Any questions about that statement? Excuse me? Okay. The thing that we know... <laughs> oh, so, so the question was, can you repeat that? The answer is yes, I can. Um, the thing that we know, V out, is that V out has to stay within plus and minus VDD. If this transistor is really good, and, and this thing doesn't go into saturation as long as there's, or doesn't go into linear, then if VT is very small of this device, and VD sat is very small, when this goes up to VDD, this will basically be VDD. When this goes down to VDD, this node will basically be down to negative VDD. So, the, the maximum amplitude on this node is equal to VDD. The amplitude is V hat, so therefore V hat could be almost as close as VDD. Okay? So that's that. Oh, then what, what's the advantage that you have for VDD for the input and the negative VDD for the ground? I mean, not ground. So, the advantage? No, there is no advantage. This is just my convention that I'm calling the supplies plus VDD and minus VDD. Okay, that's all. All right, can we, can we try to keep it down a little bit, the, the idle chatter? Um, so that's, that's, that's just what I, that's how the circuit is set up. Instead of having supply between VDD and ground, I have balance supplies. And that's typically done so that this resistance here can be connected to ground um, and, and at the quiescent point not have any current flowing through it. Okay? So anyhow, so V hat, so, so in the ideal, V hat roughly equals VDD. Okay? Now, also looking at the circuit and employing our circuit intuition, what can we say about the relationship between IB and V hat? Does anyone have any, any, any ideas? What's that? Uh, no, not quite. What, what I'm getting at here is that, so let's assume that this node here is at V out. Let's assume that, so I'll redraw it. RL. 
let's assume this node v out equals minus vdd and we've got ib here that means that vdd over r is flowing in that direction through this resistor okay so that current either has to go up through this transistor or down through this load NMOS transistors can't sink current into their source they can't float current in the opposite direction which means for this circuit all this current has to flow through IB okay therefore IB has to be greater than or equal to VDD over R and in the ideal circumstance IB is VDD over R so now what we do is let's I'll, I'll rewrite eta the previous expression V hat squared over 2R over 2 VDD times IB and let's start plugging things in so VDD is roughly equal to V hat so I'm going to do V hat over 2R over 2 V hat and um, IB is equal to VDD over R which is equal to V hat over R so V hat over R and what you end up doing is this cancels with that with that with that with that equals one quarter so the the ideal maximum efficiency of a source follower assuming that your device works really well has no VT has no VD stat you can swing all the way out to the rails the maximum efficiency is one quarter so that's eta max source follower in reality any circuit you design um, w any source follower circuit that you design is not going to get an efficiency of 25 percent because um, there are going to be limitations you know you're going to be sinking current in your bias you're not really going to be able to swing out here all the way up and down to VDD plus and minus VDD so there will be other there will be other imperfections in your circuit but with this source follower what I hope you understand is that you're never going to get an efficiency greater than 25 percent period the end okay so any questions on that Okay. So next up, which I'm not going to be able to cover all that in depth, is sort of talking about class A versus class B amplifiers. Okay. So why was the source follower so in, so inefficient if you consider 25% efficiency to be relatively poor? It's because no matter what so what we have is our source follower here IB VI VO no matter what the output voltage is and hence what the output current is this circuit here is pulling current from the supply and hence dissipating power for instance when the output voltage is at zero volts there's no current through that load resistance in other words there's no power being di being sent to the load but there's power being dissipated because this is pulling IB so this is going to pull IB so you've got current basically crowbarring from the supply to ground or to from the positive supply to the negative supply it's doing nothing except just ma generating heat okay now you end up needing that current there because you need to bias up your transistors right you know if that current weren't there if that current were to totally shut off your GM of this device would be zero and all the properties that you analyze for small signal analysis wouldn't wouldn't still be valid so that current is needed for the circuit to operate but it's not adding to the overall power delivered to the load and that's why the efficiency is low okay a more ideal circuit so so what we can a more ideal circuit is I'm going to draw two devices that are going to be drawn in black boxes
is one that sort of looks like this. You've got, you know, VIN controls one or both of these devices. Okay. And basically, so as V so this is V out. Let's call this device one and device two. Okay. So let's start drawing some curves. So let's first draw V out. So what V out over sinusoid is going to look like is something like this. Right? So let's call this I R. I R. IR is also going to look something like this. If this is V hat, this amplitude is V hat over R. Okay? So now the question is, therefore, and let's call this ID1 and this ID2. Okay? So now what we want is in order, like, like power is wasted when current flows through ID1 and can, instead of flowing into the load, continues to flow into ID2. And then you've got a current path from the positive supply to negative supply, which does nothing. Okay? So if we can generate instead a device that only turns on one device at a time in the proper way to source or sync this current, then we're going to be much more efficient because we're not wasting any power inside our circuit block. So ideally, when current needs to be sourced into this device, which, which device do we want? So, so when IR is positive, which device do we want to be sourcing current into IR? D1, right. So, doo -doo 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 -doo. so when IR is positive, we want to do that. And when IR is negative, what do we want the current through D1 to be? Zero, exactly. And similarly, ID2, when IR is positive, how much current do we want flowing through ID2? Zero, exactly. So I'll draw it just to emphasize the current during this first period is zero. I'll draw it in a different color, although I don't know that that necessarily shows up very well. Do you guys see that that's red? Okay. And then because of my sign conventions, it's like that. Okay? So now what we can do is we can calculate the efficiency of this, and I'm going to fly through the calculation, and I'm going to leave it to you to figure out how I came up with this. Is that, so, um, efficiency equals power, power load over power supply. Power load, the average power to the load is equal to V hat squared over 2R, L, okay? Power to the supply, average power to the supply, is equal to, so this is VDD minus VDD. Thank you. So is equal to 2 VDD times the average of I supply which is equal to 2 VDD times the average of ID1, right? Because you can, I mean, the current that's being sourced, you can just, the current that's coming from your supply is equal to the current of ID1, right? So you can just do that average instead, okay? And then when you do that average and assume that basically V hat is equal to VDD. And what's the other assumption you make? And that's the only assumption that you make. In other words, so that you can swing all the way out, you end up getting that the efficiency is equal to pi over 4, which is roughly 78%. Okay? So this is an ideal class B stage. In reality, so, so almost what you could do, and then I'm going to wrap it up, is what might this circuit look like? This circuit might look like, is that Saurabh? Hey, Saurabh.
V in, V out, RL. So this is what this circuit might look like. Okay? When V in goes up, V out goes up, current flows this way. Okay? So therefore, current has to be sourced by this, which means that, let's, let's assume that VT equals zero. Okay? Yes? No. Yes, I did draw it flipped. I drew it correctly, though. So this is a dual source follower. It's called a push-pull stage. It's not, it's not a CMOS inverter. Okay? And that's very intentional. So, so, so you can sort of see, this is a dual source follower, right? So if we assume that VT is zero, then as this device goes up, IR goes that way, which, and V out also goes up, which means that current has to flow through this device, okay, which means that there will be some small VGS here. So V out will be somewhat less than V in, okay, and I drew that really small. V in will be somewhat greater than V out because current is flowing through, let's call this M MP and MN. So current is flowing through MP, Okay, and because of that, that means, oops, I'm sorry, this is actually MN, this is MP. I, you confused me by talking about whether or not I flip things upside down. So therefore, this device will be off because VGS, because this, because um, uh, the gate is higher than the source of the PMOS. So MP will be off. Okay, and so basically current will be flowing through this device into the load, this device will be off as we want it to be. And then when you flip it around and go in the other direction, the exact opposite thing will happen. In reality, however, VT is not zero, right? VT is greater than zero. And that results in something called crossover distortion, um, which I don't have time to get into. But basically, you'll have, if, if VT is non-zero, in order for this voltage to move from zero, this voltage has to be at least higher than VTN, right? While this, divide, while this voltage is, say, like VTN over 2, so it's a positive voltage, this device can't turn on, and this device can't turn on either. So the output will stay at 0. So what ends up happening with this actual circuit is that you see something that the, the in, VI versus VO looks more something like this, okay? And that's distortion, and distortion is bad for reasons we'll get into later in the course. But basically, there are ways to, there are other circuit techniques you can employ to get around this problem. But this is beginning to look like what a true class B stage would be uh, implemented by, implemented as. All right? So in the back are homework threes. Are they separated by section? Okay, let me say this once more, and please listen to me. It'll make our lives easier, which will make your lives easier. Write the section that you attend on all the homeworks you hand in. Please. Friday. <laughs> this is section Friday, or section...
didn't do a lot of this stuff. Like, I did, like, a bunch of it, but not all of it. I didn't do the PF analysis. No. Uh, yeah. One thirty, I don't know. One forty is a nice Why? Because it took 24 hours. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 